Blog Talk Radio. Choices, decisions, frustrations, and pain. Knowing I'm going to forget her someday. While I still can, I'll challenge all my loved ones, every friend, to look inside their hearts and understand that I. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host and founder, Lori LeBay, and I just appreciate you all being with us. <clears throat> um, Alzheimer's Speaks, for those of you that are new to our show, is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort around the world. We believe by joining forces and sharing knowledge and having these everyday conversations about life with dementia, we can remove the stigmas attached to memory loss and help people live purposeful and powerful lives with the disease. Together, we can really help everybody understand what the true needs are and how we can be supportive and remove the myths which create the fear and isolate so many people. At our core, Alzheimer's believes that we can win this battle collaboratively against dementia. And I know the powers that be are working because we were recognized as the number one influencer online for Alzheimer's, according to Share Care and Dr. Oz. And that would not have happened alone. Uh, that was because of all of you um, clicking on your likes, um, sharing this, tweeting uh, what it is we do at Alzheimer's Speaks. Uh, <clears throat> if it is the radio platform, the blog, our dementia chats, our resource uh, website, etc., all of those little things can be shared. And again, Alzheimer's Speaks was built to help bring people together to share knowledge, to empower those in need, as well as those that want to help. So again, I thank you very, very much for helping um, raise the knowledge level out there. So many times we don't think that our friends or family need to hear this type of information because nobody's talking about it. But keep in mind, once you are dealing with this disease, you find out how many silent souls are sitting out in the world wanting information but afraid to talk about it. So, you know, <clears throat> take a moment and make a click or two and share the information with your, your friends and your circles. It doesn't take any any money to do, and it really literally takes a few seconds, and you might empower somebody else uh, with the knowledge that will help them survive and live well with this disease. Um, today we are um, we've got some great great experts with us and it's going to be a I think a very educational show and a fun show as well. And remember, you can always participate in the show with us. So if you are signed in via your computer or your iPad or whatever it is you're working with via the internet, you can use your chat box to ask questions or make comments. And I'll be monitoring those as the conversation goes. So please, we would love to hear from you and find out what your questions are um, and what your comments are. You can also call in live to the show. And to do that, just dial 714-364-4757. Again, that's 714 364 Four seven five seven, and we'll go ahead and pull you into the show. 
Um, before I introduce our first guest, I do always just like to do a few shout outs to some companies that I think have just great valuable information for people who are dealing with dementia. Um, one of the first that comes to mind is Alzheimer's Disease International. They are the association of all the Alzheimer's associations throughout the world. So if you're looking for an Alzheimer's association, check out Alzheimer's Disease International. They have tons of great resource information, and they can point you uh, to a local um, chapter in your neighborhood as well. Um, other <clears throat> Others that I think are really important is Alzheimer's Speaks, which is um, Alzheimer's Speaks, that's me, sorry, Alzheimer's Studies, which is a clinical trial group, and they have a tau trial going on right now, and they're still uh, looking for participants. So you can go to alzheimerstudies.com or the Alzheimer's team on Facebook and connect with them. And so many times people think that the only type of dementia out there is Alzheimer's disease. But we know for a fact that that's not true. Alzheimer's is one of many, many types of dementias. And so the Lewy Body Association um, is set up specifically to deal with that disease. And they can be found at lbda.org, lbda.org. We also have the Frontal Temporal uh, Lobe uh, Degeneration Association, and they can be found at the and then AFTD.org. And today we have with us the National Aphasia Organization, and I'll be giving you all that contact uh, information in just a bit. So. Um, these are kind of some, some primary um, forms that are up there that a lot of times people just need a little bit more information on. It's more specific um, to these symptoms. Coral Health um, has Music First, which is a great app you can get um, on iTunes or you can go right to CoralHealth.com, um, which, you know, music I personally believe is so powerful in terms of helping us change our attitude, and uh, get us in a better uh, space. And they have researched and done some marvelous things to find what music lifts us up and can help us eat or sleep. Um, it's just it's kind of amazing. So check out Coral Health. And then people are always looking for various activities. And Puzzle With Me is a great organization um, that has designed large puzzle pieces that are adult oriented that are um they're small i think they're only like 12 pieces um so they're easy to put together and just do a a great job in terms of helping people engage and keep busy and then the last one that i uh last two that i want to shout out to is Jiminy Wicket, uh, James Creasy down in uh, Colorado. I was out with his group to Rockefeller Center just a month ago playing Adaptive Croquet, which is just a marvelous intergenerational way to um, get people to interact with those with dementia. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Purple Angel Project, which was started by Norms McNamara over in the UK, which is the new global symbol for dementia. If you haven't checked that out, please, please do so. It's a, it's a fabulous symbol. And, you know, we have to be connected worldwide because, uh, you know, as a society, we have just grown so much and we don't just live in one little city anymore. And so we have to have a symbol that represents this disease and does it in a dignified fashion. Uh, you can go to the purpleangel.com or you can actually go to my website as well. And at the very bottom, <clears throat> if you scroll down on any page, you'll see uh, a purple angel there. You can just click on that and go directly to the organization as well. So let me go ahead and introduce our first guest. 
Um, I'm, I'm very excited to have with us today um, the Executive Director from the National Aphasia Association. And for those of you that aren't familiar with this association, they were founded in 1987, and they're very consumer-focused. They're a nonprofit that promotes public education, research, rehabilitation, and support services to assist people with aphasia and their families. Their mission is to promote universal awareness and understanding of aphasia and provide support to all persons with aphasia, their families, and their caregivers. So they're really a nice, well-rounded um, organization out there. Elaine Gansfried, uh, like I said, is the executive director of the association, and she is a speech and language pathologist. Uh, she is the past president of the NYS Speech and Language Hearing Association, Long Island Speech and Language uh, Hearing Association, the Council of State Association Presidents for Speech and Language Pathology and Audiology, and she remains um, still active in all of these associations as well. Elaine is a fellow of the American Speech and Language Hearing Association, and um, she was a site visitor for ASHA. Um, she is just extremely well-connected, as you can see from her credentials here. She has also created and managed several speech, hearing, and rehabilitation programs in New York and Massachusetts, and she is an adjunct ex instructor um, at Delphi University Garden City in New York. Um, she has written many articles and presented regionally and nationally on various topics, um, including aphasia, rehabilitation, and leadership skills. So welcome, Elaine. Thank you so much, Lori. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm thrilled to have you on the show today. I think aphasia is one of those things that <clears throat> people don't, A, really even know what it is. But before we start there, I always like to ask our guests, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a little frog in my throat, <laughs> good old seasonal allergies, I think. Um, have you ever been personally touched by aphasia or, or any type of dementia uh, with family or friends? Well, um, I, up until this point, um, fortunately, I guess I have not been personally touched. Uh, however, being a speech-language pathologist, I've certainly encountered uh, many people with aphasia as well as dementia. Um, I think that lots of people um, feel inclined to become involved when they've had a personal uh, contact with aphasia and or dementia because obviously then uh, they understand it and they feel more passionate about it. Um, but unfortunately, it's about being educated ahead of time because, as we know, the numbers of people who have dementia, who have aphasia, uh, are growing every single day. And uh, it's important for people not to wait until they have a personal experience and then all of a sudden, in the throes of everything else, they're trying to look for resources and information. But we need to do a better job of educating the public ahead of time. Well, and I totally agree. I think of, you know, when my mom got diagnosed, it would have been so nice to know what what Alzheimer's and dementia was. And, and mm -hmm. as a family, you know, not only didn't I know, but none of us really knew um, in exactly. any type of detail. And, my gosh, that would have been so, so helpful. But a lot of times we don't like to look down the rabbit hole, so to speak. That is you true. Know? <laughs> we live in our perfect little lives that we, you know, we, we think that we imagine and stuff. And, and it's important for us to really research and and have knowledge because we just don't know, um, you know, what's going to happen to us or, or someone that we care about. So I really, again, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Can you tell us, you know, what what exactly is aphasia and what causes it? Sure. So aphasia is an acquired communication uh, disorder. It's a language disorder. 
and it impairs a person's ability to speak, to process language, and sometimes to understand others as well. Um, Most people with aphasia do experience difficulty with reading and writing. But I think what's key about aphasia that we try to stress is that aphasia does not affect intelligence. So it's a loss of language but not intellect. And that's a really difficult concept for people uh, to wrap themselves around because um, we, we are a society that thinks that if you can't communicate, if you don't have verbal language, then you lack uh, competency or you lack intelligence. Um, and as we know, we can communicate in many different ways, so that's not the case at all. Um, aphasia can be caused by a variety of things, but stroke is actually the most common cause. So 25 to 40 percent of uh, stroke survivors will acquire aphasia to one extent or another. And the current statistics, I believe, with stroke is that there's approximately 800,000 strokes a year. So if you do the math and you think about 25 to 40 percent of that, we're talking about uh, at least 200,000 people every year being um, impacted by aphasia. Uh, So while stroke is the most common cause, uh, aphasia can also be acquired through a head injury of some sort, um, brain tumors, uh, other neurological conditions, And um, more recently, we've also seen a correlation between migraine headaches and uh, stroke, which in turn would be migraine headaches and aphasia. So those are the most common causes uh, of acquired aphasia. Uh, Now, I do want to differentiate between acquired aphasia from stroke or brain injury versus an aphasia that can result from... um, some um, frontotemporal degeneration and neurodegenerative disorders, uh, which is more akin to a dementia. And I know that would be something of interest to many of of your uh, listeners because there is an aphasia that is a clinical dementia, and we call that primary progressive aphasia. So uh, basically, uh, primary progressive aphasia, or we use the acronym PPA, for primary progressive aphasia. It's a clinical dementia syndrome caused by neurodegenerative disease. Uh, What's different about PPA versus other clinical dementias is that language function is the primary symptom, and that's what's slowly declining. So unlike other dementias where um, memory uh, is often the case or other um, cognitive um, behavioral domains, uh, for PPA, primary progressive aphasia, it is the language that is key. And so oftentimes what people will report is um, significant difficulties with uh, communication, so retrieving of words, thinking of words, formulating sentences, um, and obviously it's something that's going to continue to get um, Uh, worse uh, as it progresses, but um, the hallmark is that there's the absence of any kind of indication of a stroke, so any kind of infarct in the brain from stroke or any kind of brain injury when, in fact, the person does have some neurological assessments or MRIs. Okay. So, um, you know, The word stroke has come up a a ton um, with this. Mm -hmm. And do you know offhand, because I don't know this number offhand, um, and maybe you do, but the number of people that are dealing with strokes on on an annual basis, I'm I'm sure that number's got to be fairly massive. Oh, actually, yeah, it is. Um, I did mention it, but I guess I mentioned it in the in the mm-hmm. context of everything else. So the current mm-hmm. statistics, I believe, is is uh, there are close to eight hundred thousand strokes a year. Okay, and and I'm surprised that it's even only eight hundred thousand. I would have thought that it would have been even larger, and and maybe it's just because I've recently had people that in my life who have had strokes, and so now it's more top of mind. So right, <laughs> like every, well, it, everyone it, else. Mm-hmm. It seems that 
every year the number seems to go up at least to by a hundred or two hundred thousand. So, you know, as it as we move on, you're seeing, you know, a couple of years ago there was basically, you know, three hundred thousand people with strokes and now we're up to eight hundred thousand. So it, it it's increasing every single year. Um and we're also seeing many more younger people, um, which is something new as well. Um because people always thought of stroke um, and the same thing as of dementia as, you know, being something for older people or your grandmother or your grandfather, and that's not the case any longer. Mm-hmm. Do you do you think part of um, the number growth has to do with uh, just the ability to, to diagnose things better? Uh, I think to some extent I think awareness, you know, has helped. Uh, it's interesting because there's still – continues to be somewhat of a stigma attached to stroke, um, but it certainly has improved so that, you know, 10 years ago, people didn't even talk about having a stroke. Um, And now, of course, there's a lot more information and a lot more information about prevention, uh, which is important. So there are things you can do to prevent a stroke. Um, And so people are, are more inclined, you know, to be looking for those kinds of things. But, you know, paired with Um, the increased ability to diagnose it, I think there's also increased incidence because of lots of things in our lifestyle and our society. And so, um, you know, people don't necessarily eat correctly. Um, There's more incidence of diabetes, which is a, you know, uh, a factor for stroke. Um, Obesity is another issue, high blood pressure. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, migraine headaches has become uh, something new that people are looking at in terms of um, a causative factor of stroke. So, uh, so we're seeing new uh, ways for people to acquire strokes. And um, just to mention in terms of uh, people's incidence of having stroke, we're also finding in, in young women, um, unfortunately, um, it's always been the case, but more so of late that the correlation between some of the new birth control uh, pills and um, blood clots, which in fact could then cause a stroke. Okay. I just, I, I'm thinking of, you know, so many people that have the migraines and things now, and, I, and I've always kind of wondered, you know, what causes <clears throat> the migraines and, and kind of that after effect, because it, it just seems to me, in my life anyways, people with migraines typically uh tend to have some other issues later later in life um and again that could just be something fluky at my end because lord knows listeners i I, this is not scientific from this girl at all well i hope not because i actually have a history of migraine headaches so so i'm hoping that i'm not waiting to have my stroke so yeah yeah (laughs) Well, and I've had I, I've had my my share of them as well, which they've mm-hmm. gone away for me now, and and so I, I know that there's all different all different types of of causes um, that are you know they can they can trigger migraines, needless to mm-hmm. say there. So I, I don't want to give anybody any added nope. angst to there <laughs> right, at all. Right. Um, can you tell us about, you know, cases of aphasia? Maybe give some people examples, you know, of are, are they all alike or and and maybe give some like real life examples of, of how people ran across um this issue and, and what made them address it and, and come to your association. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, uh, I like to say that if you've met one person with aphasia, you've met one person with aphasia. So uh, no two people are alike. Um, while there are some um, types of aphasia, various types, and, uh, you know, I can just highlight those uh, that are most common, uh, everyone is an individual and everyone presents differently. So um, for the most part, though, um, those that, that have had a stroke or brain injury, the onset is very sudden, and the onset um occurs in uh, conjunction with this event, this either stroke or brain injury. So um, in actuality, they know that, you know, that they have difficulty with their communication because at the time that they're having their stroke or their brain injury, they're not able to communicate to some extent or another. Um, you know, two of the main 
uh, categories of aphasia that people report with um, are what we call a uh, expressive aphasia or a non-fluent aphasia, which uh, would mean that um, the person's speech output is very reduced, so they mainly have very short utterances of less than four words, so they speak very telegraphically. They have almost a very halting and effortful quality of their speech, so the, the, they like to report, people report all the time that, you know, the words are in their head and they just mm-hmm. can't get them out. So it's almost like having the words at the tip of your tongue. We've all experienced that to, to some extent or another, but imagine living with that 24-7. That's what it's like to really have an expressive aphasia, that you can't really get the words out even though you know what it is that you want to say. Um, also, People that have an expressive or a non-fluent type of aphasia tend to um, not have grammatically correct speech. Because they're speaking in shorter utterances, they tend to omit a lot of of those uh, small words that tend to help us in terms of uh, grammar and context. So things like, you know, the and in and on, the connecting words. Um, And so they tend just to say, you know, man home instead of the man is going home. And so that would be an, ex- an example of you trying to figure out, you know, what the person is saying. So that's, that's a more expressive type of aphasia, which people are more commonly familiar with, um, but there's an equally uh, devastating type of aphasia called uh, a receptive aphasia or a fluent aphasia. And uh, that is actually where speech is produced very easily. So the person is quite fluent. They're speaking in sentences. They're speaking um, uh, fluently. However, what they're saying often does not make sense. So um, they're having more difficulty with the comprehension. Because they can't understand what's being said to them, um, they're thinking that they're responding correctly to what someone is saying, but um, their communication oftentimes includes nonsense words as well as words that don't make sense. So, you know, they may, in fact, speak quite fluently um, and give you a whole sentence of, you know, um, I diddled the uh, bit in the outside and then, you know, we went down to the downtown. Now, it may not make any sense to you, but it's perfectly fluent. Um, It may not even be in response to the question that you asked. Um, Unfortunately, people that have this uh, receptive or fluent type of aphasia um, are often, more often than others, um, confused with someone that has a mental illness because their speech is confused and doesn't make sense, um, or also someone who's under the influence of drugs or alcohol, which is a big uh, misconception of people who have aphasia. Um, so that, that that's something to keep in mind. Also, someone that has a more fluent uh, type of aphasia who's speaking fluently um, can oftentimes fake it quite well. Um, and what I mean by that is um, because they can respond correctly and fluently to um, rote kinds of questions, you know, you until you really listen to what they're saying, um, oftentimes you think that they're quite appropriate and they're understanding you, but it's when you try to have a longer conversation that it becomes more difficult. Interesting. <clears throat> that has to be so um, frustrating for an individual and or a family. I mean, and with all dementias, um, you know, one of the biggest complaints is the misdiagnosis and things, mm-hmm. but to get – to get thrown in and and you know I've heard I've heard this with many others too the mental illness comes into play you're de- you're depressed but mm-hmm. with this um affluent aphasia I could see where that would be uh, you know a real easy mistake to be had um mm-hmm. with people and how how sad how sad oh yes and and you know in terms of the frustration the people that have fluent aphasia are not particularly frustrated. It's more the listener, so the family members that that are very frustrated because the person with fluent aphasia actually believes that they're responding correctly. 
So oh, okay. their comprehension is, is impaired. Um, they're talking as though they believe that what they're saying is making sense to the communication, to the conversation. Um, the frustration is actually more for the listener who is listening to them and not understanding them and also wants them to stop speaking <laughs> because people who are fluently aphasic tend to run off at the mouth a lot, a lot, because they have a lot to say. Um, in contrast to those people that have an expressive aphasia, um, or non-fluent aphasia, those are the folks that are so, so frustrated because they know what they want to say. They can see it in their head. They can hear it in their head, they often say, um, but they can't get the words out. So it's so extremely frustrating for them. Um, and, and, you know, it's just devastating to watch that frustration of them struggling. So I have a question for you. A lot of people, you know, with dementia will say, you know, I can't find my words. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll replace it with something else. Um, when does it become aphasia, you know, when the connections aren't there? Um, and I don't know if you can answer that one in particular or not, but, you know, a lot of people, you know, say, well, it's normal aging, and others say, well, not so much. And, mm -hmm, I mean, you mm -hmm. get you get all this different advice. And, mm -hmm. you know, when when is it really aphasia? When When does it really become a diagnosis and, a, and an issue at hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just want to differentiate because, you know, aphasia and acquired aphasia is different from dementia. Mm -hmm. um, and so someone that has aphasia as a result of a stroke or brain injury, um, actually their aphasia, their language issues um, are going to improve, okay? Um, and, in fact, that's what we work towards um, is improving their language through different kinds of speech therapy and stimulation. The kind of aphasia I think that you're referring to is um, the primary progressive aphasia, which is the clinical dementia syndrome. And in that case, the person who may have uh, difficulty thinking of the words or um, putting their language together, that's going to continue to decline. And so... Um, you know, I think that the the best rule of thumb for knowing when it's, you know, um, uh, well, first of all, a person needs to have a differential diagnosis. So if someone is experiencing significant word retrieval difficulties, and, you know, you know, as you said, all, we all, as we get older or even when we're not so old, uh, we all oftentimes have trouble thinking of the word um, or we get frustrated and we, we can't get our words out. Um, but I do think that, you know, we all know uh, ourselves pretty well, and um, it's when it interferes with um, your activities of daily living. So in other words, if every time you're trying to say something, you can't think of a word, and also not being able to think of very common kinds of things, like, for instance, your spouse's name or your children's name um, or, you know, the school that you went to. So things that should be very familiar to you, um, if those become more frequent, um, certainly, you know, you should maybe look into that. Um, and also as you see it becoming worse. So uh, there are many, many people with primary progressive aphasia who report that, you know, they noticed symptoms years in advance, but it just wasn't something they, they thought it was part of the normal process because it didn't become as apparent to others or to themselves in terms of interfering with their ability to get their wants and needs known and to communicate effectively. So if every time someone goes to say something, they're either substituting a word or talking around it or pausing, um, that becomes certainly uh, more cause for concern. Yeah, which which makes a lot of sense, and I appreciate you um, distinguishing the difference between the two uh, because people overlap them a lot. Um, yeah, with that, which is which is really important. What types of things can people do? You know, you're a speech pathologist to to help improve and to try to rebuild mm -hmm. those connections. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, for word find and and so forth. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, there, there are lots of general, you know, tips for communicating um, that 
people can use, um, family members can use, you know, speech pathologists would help family members, but that um, are, are helpful to the person with aphasia, actually, regardless of whether it's an acquired aphasia or it's due to um, a dementia. So, um, and a lot of these things are, are going to sound um, very simple and straightforward, but it's about incorporating them into your daily communication activities. So uh, the first thing is that's very important is to have the person's attention before you speak. So, you know, we don't really think about it too much, but uh, a person that has aphasia, um, as well as a person that has dementia, can often become distracted by outside noises or, you know, lots of loud environments. So we need to make sure that um, we limit those distractions. So if we're going to talk to the person, if we want them to respond to us, you know, turn off the television, turn off the radio, don't be in a noisy environment because you're not going to have them do as well. Um, so, you know, we can't always control for that, obviously, but to whatever extent we should be minimizing uh, those background noises and also making sure that the person, we have their attention and, um, and we're attended to them. Um, what's really important to remember for those with aphasia as well as those with dementia is, for the most part, you're dealing with adults. And, um, and so while we need to keep our communication simple, we have to remember that we're talking to an adult. And so don't talk down to the person. Um, you know, baby talk is not the way to go. Uh, talk to them as if you're talking with an adult. But we can make our communication more simple so we don't have to have 10-word sentences or very long questions, we can get right to the point, um, but we talk to them still as though they're adult. What's really important is um, confirming with the person um, with yes and no questions. So um, here's an interesting thing, though. Lots of people with aphasia confuse yes and no. So they often say yes when they mean no and no when they mean yes. So you can imagine uh, that that can be difficult. Um, but what we have to do is confirm with them that they understand that yes means yes and no means no. Uh, and we can do that in a variety of ways. Um, you know, if you are asking someone questions that you know the answer to in terms of yes and no, so you can ask them, you know, their name, you know, is your name Joe, if their name is Joe, and and if they respond no, obviously we know that they're having some confusion there. So we need to get them to understand that yes means yes and no means no. And um, oftentimes we can also do that by using some kind of a picture representation for yes and no. So sometimes the words don't have as much meaning as perhaps looking at uh, a happy face for yes and a sad face for no, or some people use thumbs up for yes thumbs down for no. Um, so that's, you know, a way of them incorporating yes and no and really confirming that. Um, to take it a step further, when you're talking to someone that has aphasia and or dementia, you actually should have your questions be in the form of questions that can be responded to with a single word of either yes or no. So don't ask the person, you know, what did you eat for lunch today? Because that's going to demand a lot more of their language abilities to come up with a full sentence, to think about it, to get all those words together. A better question would be, did you have a sandwich for lunch? And they can either answer yes or no. So it's almost like playing 20 questions. Um, but that's a, a good analogy for people to sort of phrasing your questions in the form of a yes and no. Uh, what's also important is to repeat things. So um, repeat what you've said. Um, have the person actually uh, learn the strategy of asking for you to repeat. Um, and so, you know, we oftentimes um, don't do that because we want to pretend that we've understood. Um, but a, a really good strategy for the person is to learn the phrase to say to them, can you say that again to me, or I didn't understand you. Um, and so we so oftentimes have to train the person with aphasia or dementia to do that. Um, also, give the person time. Um, most people that have aphasia uh, and or dementia need extra time, not only to process the information, but also to respond. 
So um, when we ask them a question, when we're speaking with them, we need to give them some time. Um, And, you know, obviously we have to use our judgment as to how much time is enough, um, but we shouldn't be jumping in immediately. Uh, I can tell you that most people with aphasia say that they um, don't like when people finish their sentences for them. And um, I know I don't like it myself, but... um, in defense of family members or speech pathologists, I think we tend to want to finish sentences or throw in the word because we don't want to see the person get frustrated or we don't want to see them struggle. Um, however, we need to give them time. Um, and so what I tend to do is, and, and what I tell people to do is um, give people a reasonable amount of time to respond or to think of the word. And then before I would jump in, I'm going to ask them permission. So I'm going to say to them, you know, would you like my help now? Um, Or can I help you? And if they respond affirmatively, then okay, I'm going to help them. But if not, I'm going to leave it to them to think about what they want to say still. So uh, it's about being respectful also. Um, Also, we need to be flexible in trying different ways to get the ideas in and ideas out. So pictures work really well. Um, oftentimes, a person with aphasia can respond better to pictures. Um, they also always, always need to have some kind of paper and pencil at hand. So while many people with aphasia have difficulty uh, with reading and writing, uh, a good deal of people with aphasia can actually write simple words, or may we may teach them oftentimes to draw, so make a drawing or, or simulate a drawing of what it is that they want to say to you, or we can draw something that we want them to understand. Um, Also, using the first letter of a word um, is oftentimes a cue for someone with aphasia. So either them writing the first letter or us providing that for them. So if if we think that they're trying to think of the word book, for instance, we may say to them, you know, it's a b, b, and they may come up with book, or we may write the first letter B, or they may write the first letter, and then that helps us to understand more the word that they're trying to figure out. Almost like, um, you know, when you play the game Hangman, which is actually a really good activity for people with aphasia who enjoy playing those kinds of games, filling in the letters and trying to come up with the words. Wow, these are wonderful tips. These are absolutely fantastic. And, you know, you're so right when you started that, some of them will sound real simple, but it's mm-hmm. incorporating them into our daily life. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's it's like, okay, we all know we should eat better. We all know we should exercise, but how many <laughs> of us do, you know? And mm-hmm. the, the simple little things of, you know, like getting rid of background noise, you know, looking someone in the eye, um, really being mm-hmm. present, um, and, and just that, you know, being respectful of that relationship and, you um, you know, these are just really, really wonderful, wonderful tips. Have you, you know, I, I know you've dealt with like a zillion families um, in mm-hmm. uh, in your work. Um, can you share with us maybe a story of of how some of these tips have changed somebody's relationship? Um, because, like you said, it's a lot of times it can be the caregiver that might be a little bit more frustrated, depending on the type of aphasia that the person has, but does anything um, come to mind in terms of, uh, I'm sure you've had um, people say, wow, that really helped. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know? oh, absolutely. Well, it's interesting because um, uh, most family members and friends, you know, the, the hardest thing is they don't know what to do. And um, it's it's also, you know, what happens is it's that lack of, of education, of understanding, and the fear um, of not knowing what to do or doing the wrong thing. So, you know, I've worked with many uh, a family member that, you know, just by saying to them, you know what, pull out a piece of paper and have a pen handy all the time. And just by them having that there, it's almost like a comfort, you know, so they know they can write things, they can draw things, the person with aphasia. Um, and immediately, you know, it's eliminated a lot of um, the frustration and also – you know, a lot of, of um, the anger for the person with aphasia because they're not being understood. So, 
you know, something as simple as just having a paper and pencil or um, what's really nice and we suggest to families is getting one of those little uh, dry erase boards, you know, the write-on wipe-off boards. And um, you can either, you know, have them up around the house and have them in different places throughout the house um, so that wherever you are, you're you're able to communicate with the person. Um, you know, now, of course, technology has overtaken the world. And, <laughs> and so lots of people have, you know, uh, iPhones and iPads. And so um, they also can use, you know, um, their devices to do those similar kinds of things to search those of them, obviously, that are, are technology savvy or interested in it. But, you know, I like to keep it simple. And frankly, you know, I'm a still a paper and pencil kind of gal, so even when I'm um, making my own lists, you know, I don't do anything on the computer. I actually just write a list by hand, and I think, you know, if we suggest to people that they keep it simple that way. Um, the other, you know, thing that um, we've had families say to us is, um, you know, they, they had forgotten, you know, how much you communicate without words. So, you know, just by their facial expressions, you know, or their gestures, that just by including a gesture along with the word uh, oftentimes helps the person to understand. And, you know, we forget that we speak in so many different ways that that's a really good tool for them. You know, use your gestures, use your facial expressions, because you would be surprised how much you convey through that. Yeah, and and it is something that you know in all of my teachings and stuff too that I I really try to connect people with those nonverbals. They're so mm-hmm. powerful, and mm-hmm. yet we are so oblivious to the impact. Yes. Um, and it's massive. It's just mm-hmm. absolutely massive. We think if we put a fake smile on our face, no one yes. knows we're stressed or we're frustrated or or we're angry and it it comes through in you know a zillion other fashions (laughs) right and you know what's interesting lots of people with aphasia are actually much more attuned to facial expressions or nonverbal cues and so they've actually done some studies but people with aphasia can oftentimes better pick out someone who's lying (laughs) Mm -hmm. than someone who doesn't have aphasia because they're more in tune to those nonverbal cues that we give off, you know, when we're more uncomfortable. So it's been kind of, it's kind of funny. I I can see that. Well, you know, they say when someone has a disability, like if they can't see, you know, the other senses pick up. Absolutely. And I I really do think that there's a balance um, Mm -hmm. that comes Mm -hmm. into play because um, instinctively our bodies know we still have to communicate. Um, and, you know, they're able to dig deeper um, because they're more concentrated than what, you know, we just take so much for granted. It, that's exactly right. Every life. And when something like that hits, all of a sudden you don't. And, right. you know, it's it's just so important. One of the um, games that I play when I'm doing uh, education in the in like junior high and high school, it's the 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 marshmallow. They call it the marshmallow bunny game, where you put marshmallows in your mouth and someone has mm-hmm, to talk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we talk about simulating, you know, um, a stroke where you know, sure. and the whole class starts laughing and the person's foaming at the mouth and they're trying to talk with a mouth mm-hmm. full of marshmallows and and I'm prodding them and I'm you know telling them you know that they have to enunciate better and they can't hear you and blah 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 and I'm just kind of badgering this poor volunteer and you know everyone kind of you know giggles through this whole thing and then we talk about what was this really like and we we ask the person who's got all these marshmallows in their mouth um, how did you feel? And they were, you know, they talk about the stress and the embarrassment and the physical changes in their body, that their breathing changed, and you know, they got really hot because they were really anxious, and they could feel their mm-hmm. their blood pressure rise. And I mean, there was just all of these these physical changes that were sure. coming on. And then they talked about the whole emotional impact. And mm-hmm. then we talked about, you know, what did the audience feel like? And, and they said, you know, it was frustrating to hear because they, they couldn't mm-hmm. understand and they wanted to help them, but they were laughing because it was in a safe place. And mm-hmm. then we, mm-hmm. you know, broke it out and said, okay, so think of what it's like 
to, for someone who, you know, this isn't a role play game. Right, this is it's real life every life. day. Every minute of every mm-hmm. day is mm-hmm. like this for them. Mm-hmm. And then they're going to therapy working so hard to improve, and they're still picking up on these subtle giggles and points mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. comments that people are making, and they're working so hard. You know, it's like we, we have to be better people right. and and realize what it is we're doing. And the kids, you know, through this exercise, they really get it, you know. Oh yeah. And it, and it's and it affects everybody. Um, oh yeah. In life, all day long. Right, and we, you know, we tell uh, family members and friends, uh, you need to be honest. In other words, it's not about, you know, let's not avoid the large pink elephant in the middle of the room. You know, if you're not understanding someone, or if you're having trouble, you know, acknowledge that because. You know, we're, we're, it's about the respect. It's about acknowledging that the person is competent, that they're a competent communicator, but we may be having trouble now. So, you know, saying to them, you know what, I'm not understanding you. You know, maybe we can try a different way. Or oftentimes we tell people to let things go, you know, because sometimes we just get so hung up on, you know, understanding the one thing, and mm-hmm. it just takes us to a place that we shouldn't be. So, you know, even saying to them, you know, is this important right now? You know, or can it wait till later? And so sometimes when you come back later, you know, you can do a better job of, of understanding each other. Um, and the fatigue factor is huge. It, you know, it takes an inordinate amount of energy, you know, to communicate without words. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, people get tired and the listener gets tired as well. So um, you need to be sensitive to that as well. Well, that's a good point. I, I guess I never thought of the exhaustion point mm-hmm. um, because it isn't natural. I mean, it is. It, it's so much more encompassing. Absolutely. You know, we, a wife of someone with aphasia, I think she, you know, put it best when she says, um, you know, that every day is one long game of charades. Mm-hmm. And, you know, while she chuckles about it and her husband that has aphasia, you know, chuckled about it, um, that's actually what it is. So think about, you know, when you're playing charades, it takes a lot of energy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Every, the entire communication process is about, you know, giving cues and giving clues and, and gesturing and, and trying to think of, you know, how you can say it, how you can get someone to understand without using the words. So uh, I think that's, you know, a really good analogy of, of the frustration and the, and the energy that it takes. You know, we have um, one person in one of our... Um memory cafes and she's Mm -hmm. she's come up with picture books that she uses for her husband because he just struggles Mm -hmm. you know with with being able to verbally communicate and so she has um she has this book of like restaurants and it's all the logos for all the restaurants and then she's even gotten um menus and she's cut out some of his favorite things so that mm-hmm. you know he can look through that and say this is what I want and point if he just can't do it so there's you know and that's been that's worked really really well for them for a long a long long time but it's also a lot of work um and she oh, said one yes, day it he, is. one day he hid them and she said she, she she couldn't find them for a long time, and she kept thinking, oh, I'm going to have to make these books up all over again, because she had all different kinds, you know, for restaurants and different stores that they go to, and, you know, just kind of their whole life, you know. And mm-hmm. and, and then she said she found them in the strangest spot. But, oh, I bet. you know, she said she found them. Mm-hmm. Good. <laughs> they, were, they were all back and stuff, but really very, very much helped um right help them in terms of their communication. Um, I do want to talk um, and get on to some of the resources that you have available for people. Exactly. That was my next thing as well. Okay. So I wanted to be sure that people understand that, you know, obviously there's lots of um, information that we gave in this last uh, hour or so, um, but you can access all this information um, through our website. So you can contact us at uh, aphasia.org, that's A-P-H-A-S-I-A dot org. Uh, Anyone that contacts us, uh, we will send a free information packet. A couple of other resources, we also have um, a hotline, so people can contact us from all over the country. We have an 800 number, 
Um, I'll give it to you now, and then I'm, hopefully you can post it on your website. It's mm-hmm. uh, 800-922-4622. Once again, that's 800-922-4622. And so all those communication tips that I talked about, uh, we actually have um, materials that we can, you know, provide to you that have those tips. We also have some publications that people might be interested in as well as um, a really nice DVD, uh, an educational DVD about aphasia called It's Still Me, which is great to show to family and friends. Um, so you can get resources uh, through our website, through contacting us. Um, we uh, have been doing uh, aphasia awareness training for emergency responders. So we've actually been training police, firefighters, and EMTs uh, throughout the country to know what aphasia is and how to respond and communicate with a person with aphasia in an emergency situation. So if uh, any of your listeners are interested in uh, getting involved with doing some local training, they can contact us as well. Uh, I also wanted to uh, point out an upcoming conference that people might be interested in. Um, We've partnered with uh, the Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration that I know you referenced earlier, as well as um, Northwestern University's Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease Center, and uh, we are putting together a one-day conference on frontotemporal dementia and primary progressive aphasia, and it's for um, uh, people who are, who have these disorders as well as family members. Uh, it, so it will be a one-day conference to be held in Chicago on November the 4th, uh, which is coming up shortly. Uh, but I strongly encourage people to look into it because, as you very well know, there's limited resources for people who have uh, these type of dementias. And um, in particular, there's limited opportunities for people to get together uh, and network and talk to each other. And uh, this conference has been so popular. When we did it the first time a few years ago, we had about 50 people And the last time we did it last year, there were over 350 people from not only across the country but internationally. So um, if people want to find out more information about that, they can go on to our website, which once again is aphasia.org. But it's an upcoming conference uh, that I think people might be interested in. Wonderful. Well, this has just been absolutely um so educational. Um, I know not only for myself, um, but for our listeners. And uh, you just gave us so much good information. I really appreciate this hour that you spent with us. Very, very oh, my much. My pleasure. Really. And, and well, please thank you. Feel, mm-hmm. Yeah, please feel free to. Um, you can put up my email address if you'd like on your website. Uh, so okay. people are welcome to email me directly. Um, it's Gansfried. It's my last name. G A N Z. F R I E D at aphasia dot org, and uh, I'm happy to speak with anybody that might have some uh, questions that they uh, didn't either get to ask here or think about later. And uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity, Lori, and um, I commend you on the wonderful work you're doing. And I hope that we can continue to collaborate. Oh, definitely. It's important for all of us to stay connected and share share information and resources so that people in need can can find this information so you have a wonderful week and again thank you for all you're doing i really appreciate it thank you my pleasure bye-bye bye-bye before i go ahead and introduce our second guest i always just like to kind of do a mid-program recap of what alzheimer speaks has been up to since our last radio show which was on the first, and that one was on frontal temporal lobe dementia. So if you are interested in learning more about that disease, I think you'll find that to be a fascinating conversation as well. Um, Hugo DeWall um, over in Europe was not able to, to make the show, and so we are still trying to get him rescheduled. And he was going to talk about home design, and he has a, a book which is called Designing and Delivering Dementia Services. So we will definitely, definitely get him get him back on the program. Um, just had difficulty with connections. 
Our next show coming up will be on the 15th, and we're going to talk about witnessing Alzheimer's. So we're going to have one caregiver talk about her experience. We're going to have a professional on. And then I will actually be in Wisconsin and uh, in Watertown where we're going to be opening up a new memory cafe. And we are also going to be launching, which we believe will be the first um, or one of the first, I have not heard of, of any others officially, uh, first dementia-friendly city in the U.S. So we're very, very excited about that. And I'll be posting some information um, with some press releases on the blog here uh, yet this week on that. Our last Dementia Chats, which is a webinar series that I do twice a month, was on the 24th of September. Uh, and that's where I interview people with dementia. They are our experts. And they talked um, significantly about the effects of silos and people not working together and the importance of collaborations. They also talked about uh you know, how they work with doctors and the awareness that is needed in the medical profession in and of itself regarding dementia. And our chat today, we're going to be talking about changes and moving and small moves, big moves. Um, what can you do to help somebody with dementia maneuver and feel safe through that transition? A few of the past blogs was uh, I have an intern, Michelle, who just did one called Patience is a Virtue. Um, Michael Ellenbogen's story, Living with Dementia. I just put um, a little reference to uh, his article, which was posted on Katie Couric's website. And if you miss Katie Couric's uh, show, uh, you can go to Alzheimer's Speaks blog um, for October 3rd, and you'll see the links for that. You'll also see she's got some resources posted. She had also asked me to submit an article, which is on her blog as well, or, or on her website. Uh, the video uh, of the show is broken down into segments, and so you'll see Victor Garber, who's an actor, talk about is he going to get tested or not because his parents had it. And then there's a couple from right here in Minnesota who's dealing with early onset, and their story was quite, quite powerful. Uh, Again, I want to just mention some of our sponsors. Uh, the Purple Angel Project, if you're not familiar with that, again, is the global symbol for dementia. If you aren't aware of it, I, you know, just Google it. Um, anybody can, can use this Purple Angel to help raise awareness. Uh, Alzheimer's Disease International, again, is the place you can go anywhere in the world to find an Alzheimer's association close to you. But don't forget about the other associations with specific needs, um, like the aphasia, the National Aphasia Association with Elaine, who we just had on, or the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration, or the Lewy Body Association. Um, each of these particular um, associations will be able to help you with these specific diagnoses. And the Alzheimer's Studies uh, group or the Alzheimer's team on Facebook, uh, through them, you can go ahead and connect to the Tau study. And if you're looking for some entertainment with somebody with uh, dementia, the Jiminy Wicket Adaptive Croquet Program is wonderful, or the Puzzles with Me, again, is another great way to be able to, to connect with individuals. Well, our second half of the show, I'm really quite excited because um, the two gals that are going to join us, um, I'm actually going to be able to spend a few days with them later on this week. And I know that this will be a very interesting um, and exciting conversation. Uh, today we have with us Lori Ellis Young who has done dozens of trucks uh, in the Himalayas and the Andes, which has really impassioned her with her power of breath. And some of you might be going, what the heck is the power of breath? But stay with us because you're going to find out, and it is pretty darn powerful. Lori is an international speaker, a yoga teacher, a group facilitator, and an author. She is a pioneer in breath work as in powering and um 
as a healing modality. And, you know, I've gone to some of her classes on this, and I've been shocked at what I've learned and what I've walked away with um, as an individual. Lori uh, is also the uh, director of Breath the Cha- or Breathe the Change and the nonprofit uh, Breath Logic. And her vision of you know, of breath is really about awareness and wellness, and she is now implementing these teachings in schools, in universities, in medical centers, in corporations, and organizations all around the globe. And um, before I pull Lori into the conversation, I'm also going to go ahead and introduce uh, Nancy who is her her cohort here. And Nancy and I have been good friends for a long time. Nancy uh, Chakran, um, over the past five decades, has developed three award-winning careers. She is a um, a photographer, a graphic designer, and uh, she does these just gorgeous, gorgeous landscape paintings. Her gold medal book, Friendship, the Art of Patience, which she did with Lori Ellis Young, includes inspirational friendship quotes and photogra- um, uh, photographs of women from the age of 10 to 100 with, uh, with partners doing yoga poses in just these absolutely spectacular natural settings all around the globe. It's it's quite fascinating. Um, I know I bought quite a few of them. They just make for great, great gift books, and they're just so exquisitely done. Nancy returned uh, from living over on the East Coast back in 96, and she's now in Minnesota, and she came back to care for her elderly parents. And over a 12-year period, she was a passionate health care advocate, and a compassionate daughter every single step of the way. And during this period, she also helped another friend, Barbara Lee Friedman of Music Memories, produce a songbook with uh, her uh, photography for the elderly. And later, both of them created several videos and DVDs of patients (laughs) and their family members in hospice (laughs) environments. One of which was um, Nancy had actually done some uh, videography for myself um, and my mother. So if you want to see those, those are actually on my YouTube. I've seen those at conferences all over the place. A uh, lot of lot of people are, are utilizing Nancy's work. Nancy's also a survivor of breast cancer. And uh, while she was healing from that, she returned to her love of landscape painting and photography. And her artwork is now an international collection, and and it's exhibited all over uh, the Midwest in wellness and medical centers. She's also the recipient of the University of Minnesota's 2012 Buckman Fellowship for Leadership in Philanthropy. And she has served on the Struthers Parkinson's Advisory Board and the board chair for a non for the nonprofit Breath Logic. So, um, Nancy and Lori, welcome to the show. Hi, Lori. Hi, hi Lori. Nancy. Well, hi, Lori. I won't forget your name, I, even though you spell it different. <laughs> well, I am so excited to have you two on the show because I think you are going to just um, – really help people, you know, through this this journey that you're both on, um, you know, live better with dementia. Um, or, you know, if they're caring for somebody. And, again, so much of what you do, um, it, it can, can help people in everyday life. Our show just happens to focus more on the dementia. But um, I think what we're going to talk about today, people are going to see how powerful this this is. So um, before we start, I'm just going to ask each of you, um, and I'll start with Nancy. Have you been touched personally by dementia with family or friends, Nancy? Well, if you mention my bio, I really mm-hmm. have. I literally cared for my parents for 
about a 12-year period, and I didn't have children myself, and I always wanted to be a nurse, and due to a back injury, I could not be. And so when I came back to Minnesota, when people would say, do you have kids? And I said, yeah, one's 92 and the other one's 87. <laughs> and as they got older, I just, I really noticed a serious decline in their cognitive functions. Um, both of them, they gradually lack the ability to make sound decisions. I, they both had difficulty processing information and multitasking. Um, they could not pay the bills. Eventually we had to take Dad's driver's license away. And what was really significant is my mother had Parkinson's disease. And as you know, dementia is really a side effect of Parkinson's disease Um she was absolutely a, a delightful little human being, and but near the end of her life, she had difficulties really communicating and doing anything to take care of herself. So it was really a, a serious um, uh, learning curve in dealing with her dementia. And... One of the significant parts of um, of of working with her was I had attended this Parkinson's Progress and Possibilities Conference. And, Laura, I know we had talked, and you mentioned that you know Dr. Pauline Boss also, who mm-hmm. wrote the book Ambiguous Loss, Learning to Live with Unresolved Grief. And... She said some things at that conference that so resonated with me that I just kind of turned around my um, thought process and how I was going to work with mom's dementia. And I wanted her to live life to the fullest in spite of that, in spite of the Parkinson's. I was getting her out of the nursing home during the past six years that she was there. I would get over to the Struthers Parkinson Center. And I just, I wanted her life to be as totally full as possible. And I loved what Pauline Boss said about um, that the um, the psychological absence can be as devastating as a physi- physiological absence. And a loved one is often present, but as the disease progresses, her mind is not and She just really encouraged families to celebrate the part of their loved one that is still present and to mourn the part that is lost. So I would take Mama out of the nursing home, and we'd go on trips together. And one of my favorite things was taking her to the state fair. She'd love to do that every every year. And she was at the state fair dancing with Barbara Lee Friedman at night at uh, six weeks before she died. So I totally wanted her to live life at the fullest. Oh, that's wonderful. That is wonderful. How about you, Lori? Have you been touched at all by dementia with family or friends? Yes, Lori. You know, my mother was almost 92 years old, and she died in April. And she, her mind was just absolutely amazing until probably the last few months. And so I got an understanding for what Nancy went through for so long. And just the sadness of of watching someone that you love dearly who has been there in, you know, such a a very uh, clear way throughout your life, all of a sudden not be able to be there. And also my um, my husband's father lives up in northern Minnesota, and he has progressive dementia now. He's had it for several years. So watching his decline, I because I live out of the country, I don't get to see him that often, and it's actually shocking 
you know, every time I see him, the decline. So, yes, it's it's touched me also. Okay, great. We're getting a little bit of echo with you, Lori, and I don't know if you guys are on the same phone line or not, and, and I don't know if it's possible to call in on two different lines. We are one's on cell, one's on landline, but is it I okay? Well then, okay. So then, I, we I don't know. We should maybe it, be in a different room. Yep. Would that help? Yep. Yeah, that might help. That might help. Yeah. So okay. is that better, Lori? Yep, that does sound better. Does sound better. Okay, Wonderful. Okay. Well, we'll just see. We'll just see how it goes. You never know with these old phones. Um, Lori, I'm going to throw the first question to you because I, I'm just so interested in raising awareness about your breath work and stuff. So first of all, how did you become interested in helping people breathe? I mean, it just it's such a basic <laughs> thing we all do, and we all take it, it for granted. Um, yes, and I know exactly. So how how did how did you get down this path? How what well, you know what bells went know, off to? First, Lori, I think I started practicing yoga in the early 70s, actually about 1971, 72, and that was when I first started to see that just bringing my awareness to my breath, you know, to, changes the breath and strengthens the breath, and began to notice um, being able to to think better in in school. I was in high school at the time, and the stress relief that came from it right away. But then it was, you mentioned that I I have been in Nepal and Peru, and it was really the trekking lorry in, in the Himalayas and in the Andes that helped me realize that the way we breathe can increase our physical stamina, I mean, just just amazing, and this is something that athletes, runners, um, and anybody who's interested in physical activity or just even having more energy and vitality, getting out of bed in the morning, you know, can can access through the breath. And then the stamina that comes mentally and emotionally and spiritually with the breath. I mean, breath is life, right? And if you... You know, when when we come into this life, we come in on the inhalation. And when we leave, we leave on the exhalation. And, you know, holding my mother's hand when she took her last breath and then she was gone, it it just really is so, makes you so poignant, poignantly aware that breath is life. And so... What I realized in the trekking was that, you know, breath is not just the physical, but it is all of life, and that the quality of our lives is directly reflected to the quality of our breath. That's what I brought back. Okay. Well, that that makes a lot of sense. Now, one of your presentations is entitled The Brain and Breath, and most of us, I, again, we just take this for granted. What, what's the connection, you know, between the two? Well, um, first of all, uh, with with breath, we bring in oxygen, and oxygen powers the brain, and the brain powers us. It powers all of our functions, and so it was something you know that I learned again in with trekking is. Um, just how important oxygen is for clear thinking, how important oxygen is for, as I said, every single function. So when, well, okay, I want to share a little statistic. Our brain weighs only about 2% of our total body weight, you know, which is really very little. You would think our brain would weigh more than that. But, you know, you think of the oxygen that is circulating through our body. At any one time, 20%, one-fifth of our total circulating oxygen is in our little brain because that's how important oxygen is for all of the functions. So that when we... we, uh, 
when we breathe in different ways, we activate different parts of the brain. For example, you might have heard of an amygdala hijacking. <laughs> have you ever heard of that? No. Uh, <laughs> you know, although the amygdala is a very small part of the brain and it's a primitive part of the brain, and so if something happens to trigger us to become angry or frustrated, we revert to a fight, the fight or flight response or the stress response, and the brain then sends signals to activate the sympathetic nervous system. So our functions and organs basically start to close down so that we can have the energy to flee or to fight. That's the fight or flight response. So just by changing the way we breathe, like, for example, bringing the breath into the belly, doing the belly breath, because normally if we're, if we're anxious, if we're frightened, if we're frustrated, if we're stressed, we aren't breathing very deeply and we're breathing very shallowly in the upper chest. So the act of bringing the breath down into the belly using the diaphragm sends signals to the brain to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which, is, which elicits the relaxation response. So the brain and the breath are directly related. And the more, the more we can be proactive in becoming conscious of our breath, taking deeper breaths, slower breaths, getting the breath into the belly, the more we create and strengthen the neural pathways that help us to be more relaxed be more calm, be more peaceful. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. And when I, you know, went to um, one of your retreats, I mean, I was shocked, literally shocked, how much air and oxygen my body can hold. Because I I never, I I didn't know to breathe (laughs) that deep. I didn't know that I could. And I, and I I was absolutely amazed. Um, at the exercises, and, and and I would imagine over time, um, you can probably I would imagine stretch that capacity even more, which always you know made me fascinated. You know how Houdini could stay underwater, like you said, well, with the different athletes and stuff. Yes. How how yes. they can do what they did is they they they're really maximizing. Um, these these muscles and their body um, mm-hmm. to to, mm-hmm. to full utilization, or just the relief of taking a deep <clears throat> breath. I mean, when I mm-hmm. get when I get stressed now, I mean, I automatically I, I just kind of shut down and I take very deep breaths and I you know push everything out. And as I'm pushing everything out now, I I tell it to release everything that I don't need. And then when I take mm-hmm. it in, that I'm asking for all the gifts that I that I need mm-hmm. to move forward. And that that in a, in itself has been so powerful to me and helped me stay calm and in control and you know, not not wig out, but just feel like okay, I can mm-hmm. get through this no matter what it is. Mhm. Mhm. Beautiful. Beautiful. I might say that when I have witnessed and you too, Lori Lori Ellis Young uh, demonstrating the deep belly breathing that she's been doing this for so many years that people are just stunned to see how her belly expands and the capacity that she has to uh, take in and let out the air. It's um, just last evening in one of her presentations, people were really <laughs> sad. They couldn't believe it. Yeah, it's fascinating to to be able to see that and to think I could do that myself. I mean, because we just mm-hmm. we don't go there. We don't think about it. You know, we're not we're just not conscious about something so basic that's so necessary <laughs> to every yeah. second of our yeah. life. Yeah. Um, well, you know, in, in one reason why breathing in the belly is, you know, is so important again with the brain is that 
when we when we breathe in the belly physiologically, it is impossible to be in a state of panic. I mean, because the the brain activates the parasympathetic nervous system, and so when we're in panic, we're either not breathing or otherwise we're breathing very, very shallowly in the upper chest. And also, with Lori, what you were talking about with the capacity for the breath is most people, if they are sedentary, and you think of it as we get older, um, and and also Alzheimer's patients uh, can tend to be very, very sedentary, we are breathing with only about 10% the capacity of the lungs. So if you think of that, then with the oxygen that needs to be in the body, because oxygen powers not just our brain, but feeds our very cells, is if we can just become a little more active even, we can get more oxygen and there's going to be changes, positive changes. Well, I'm I'm really excited to um, you know be able to be with you later this month because I know for myself, and I mean I'm in my mid fifties, but you know I sit by my computer way too much, and I've gotten very sedentary. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm very much looking forward to um, learning more and um, you know getting kind of a refresher course and some things that I know. Um, and try to change some habits for myself because it's huge. I mean, it's just, Mm -hmm. it's it's absolutely massive. And, you know, we're getting so many more people now with um, early diagnosis with dementia that um, Mm -hmm. between them and their caregivers, I mean, breathing is is an exercise that could still be done um, and incorporated into routine that I think would be really beneficial because, I mean, the more oxygen we all have, the better we function um, Mm -hmm. as a very basic, basic cue. Um, But that whole relaxation factor, because there's so much anxiety wrapped in this disease um, that it can help alleviate as well. Um, I think it's a beautiful beautiful technique and way and it you know it doesn't have to cost you know a zillion dollars you don't have to you know sign up to go to a fitness center to do it you can do it in your own house um, right. in pretty much any location once you learn learn the techniques um now you also have a presentation and you do workshops for caregivers. Can you give some advice that you can share, you know, for caregivers that are that are working with um, people who have dementia? And this could be family members or professionals. Um, yes. Well, um, one thing, Lori, I um, am so glad that you mentioned the computer mm-hmm. because uh, I, I would think most people now, whether you're – Almost whatever profession you have, you are using the computer a lot. And being on the computer is just the most wonderful time to start programming awareness of breath. Every time something downloads, (laughs) train yourself to just, instead of wishing that the computer did it would download faster, is use that time to take a deep breath. So if you're a caregiver that uses the computer, that's something that, you know, that you can do. But um, one uh, technique that is so simple, Lori, but is is something that our our body naturally does, the, the natural wisdom of the body, to let go. And this is for actually both caregivers and for the Alzheimer's patients themselves, is letting go letting go of frustration, letting go of stress, letting go of, you know, any emotion that might come up that, you know, we just want to let go of. Did you notice what I just did as I said that? I took a breath. I sighed. <laughs> I <laughs> sighed. And it's something, you know, when when we become frustrated or, or angry or upset is our body naturally wants to sigh to let go of that, and so that's something that just becoming more conscious of, knowing 
when there's something that, when you're feeling stressed, when you're feeling anxious, when you're feeling sad, when you're feeling like there's there's nothing that you can do, you know, um, is to take a deep breath, hold the breath, savor it for just a moment, and then just let go audibly. <sighs> and that simple technique, Lori, can change lives. Just letting it go. Well, you know, yeah, and it, it's, 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 it's funny because we, um, and sad at the same time, because we do, we hold on to so much that we don't even know we're holding on to. Right. Um, but when you make that physical change and you're conscious of that release, it, I mean, it's huge. <laughs> it's, anyways, it has been for me. I mean, it's it's just a massive shift in my mindset. It's a massive shift in, I, I feel, in my body as a whole. Um, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I, I feel lighter, I feel happier, I feel um, you know, more alive. Yes, yes. Well, and then, Lori, after you you sigh, and it's a deeper, longer sigh, the more you do it, the more you practice, it becomes deeper and longer. And then what happens is because you've had a stronger exhalation, you have a deeper inhalation, and then you get more oxygen. And Mm -hmm. again, oxygen powers the body. It helps strengthen the immune system and all of the other benefits that come from it. So it's it's, uh, double benefits. It's so simple but so powerful. Yeah, it's it's funny how we take things for granted. Um, You know, as simple as as breathing in the the prior guest, Elaine with the National Aphasia Association, we were talking about different techniques and, you know, how to how to work with somebody who's got aphasia. And she said, you know, they're going to sound really simple. <laughs> but what? she said, it's about incorporating these very simple things into daily life um, on a yes. conscious level. And that's the trick. Yes, yes. It's just, just programming ourselves to take moments of doing this. To mm-hmm. like whenever if when the phone rings, before you pick up the phone, take a deep, full, conscious breath every time. I mean, and and again, the computer when you're um, stopped at a red light or a stop sign, take a deep breath. There's so many different ways and different circumstances that we can program this. This breath awareness, whether it's a deep breath or whether it's a sigh, all throughout the day. Which makes a which makes a lot a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Because you know, what's funny when you were talking about just sitting at the computer instead of getting mad at the computer for not moving <laughs> fast enough. Okay. Even though it, it happens in seconds, but it's not nano yeah. seconds yet. You know. Um, you know, we used to have to mail things or physically run over or fax things. And, I mean, it, it's kind of funny, the progression, and we still, it's not fast enough. Um, but instead of trying to control something that we can't, taking that back and controlling what we can by just breathing. Yes. And, and breathing yes. differently and, and taking and looking at it almost in a, in a grateful mode of thank you for giving me this time because you know what I almost forgot <laughs> that I that right. I need to be beautiful consciously um, mm-hmm. you know it's, mm-hmm. it's so it's so it, it's so silly that we don't do that but we are just you know in such a fast paced world that we live um, we mm-hmm. really need to be much more in tune mm-hmm. of being grateful. And right. to realize that the only thing we can control is is ourselves, and and not everything regarding that is possible mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. You know, if mm-hmm. we get you know a disease or an illness, we can't always control that specifically, but we can control how we're going to deal with it, how we're going to live with it, and and I think that's part of the beauty with with breath works is. Um, 
you know, it teaches us that we have a, a lot more choice. We have a lot more control over ourselves than we realize. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and how we want to um, move forward and and um, and live our lives. Um, mm-hmm. I, let me throw a couple of um, questions over to Nancy there because I I just can't believe she's staying quiet this long. You know our Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> not not my usual pattern, right? <laughs> Nancy is the, the queen of connections, and I, I have to share this with my audience. The first time I met Nancy was at a shift meeting, which um, we went around and introduced people, and it was she was on a whole other side of the room, kind of up in a balcony, and she introduced herself. And as soon as she spoke, I, I poked my friend and I said, I have to meet that woman. Uh, I just, I, I'm supposed to meet that woman. Um, and I, so I ran over, you know, after the meeting, and I scurried and got in line with, you know, 10,000 other people wanting to meet Nancy. Because she's just got this, she just has this personality and this aura around her. Uh, she is just such a kind soul and a sweet woman and um, is always looking at how she can help someone else. And so, um, I, she, she's just a very, very precious friend. So I had, I had to share that. That's with very kind of you. Well, it's very true. It's very, very true. And it's, it's so fun to see you get involved in so many different facets because you are so passionate. I mean, when you jump in, it's, it's both feet, whole body, and if you're close to you, you're coming with. <laughs> <laughs> you're just kind of this little tornado um and you you just are able to ignite passion and enthusiasm and you know the way you present things it, it's just it's so it's just so beautiful um you know through through all of your work so let's talk Nancy a little bit about you know you cared for your elderly parents for 12 years i mean that's a, that's a long long time can you tell us some of your personal experiences with dementia? Like what what was probably what was the most difficult thing for you to deal with with the disease? Um you know, just watching them, watching my parents decline and know that they could not really function well for themselves. Um but, you know, one reason that Lori Ellis Young and I really connected was that we both both have compassionate hearts and we enjoy being of service to others, helping others, and we we both help care for our parents. Um, and I just, I really wanted them to live every day at their fullest, and I, I ensured that they did that. I was a a fierce advocate for my parents and their health care, and I know the importance of that, and I know there are many in the audience that are doing that, too, and I've, you know, seen that with you, Lori, also with your mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, you have a choice. You know, you can, you can live with the disease, you can deny the disease, or you can try to change the disease, you know, or or how society deals with it at least. And um, I figure if if I was put into this sector, I'm supposed to do something about it. (laughs) You know, I'm supposed to, uh, you know, and I like to think that in pretty much all aspects of my life, that hopefully I add value, you know, where I go. you know, big or little, it doesn't make any difference. But um, I, you know, that's just kind of how I how I look at at life in general, and it it sure seems like that's the way you look at it as well. Um, Absolutely. Now, you are also a member of the International Global Arts in Healthcare and the Midwest Arts and Healthcare Network. Can you tell people how you participate and um, how that might be connected to dementia? Well, these are phenomenal organizations. Uh, one of them used to be called the Society of Arts and Healthcare, and it's now 
the International Global Arts and Healthcare. And before I even learned of these organizations, I realized that I was really practicing their mission. Um, the more I learned about these organizations, I found that research studies uh, validate that patients uh, heal faster, um, fewer days in the hospital when they're surrounded by art and dance and singing, photography, storytelling, and acting. And the one way that, well, several ways that I'm involved with the arts is both through my oil painting and photography. And I had been invited to have my art in different medical centers. I had cancer in the year 2000, breast cancer, and I had not painted in a number of years. I went back to my painting then um, with an incredible passion, and I was very excited to be doing it again. And I don't, um, I don't do things solely. I just really hopped in and, and <laughs> started getting into galleries and group shows. But what I found is that once I was invited to be in hospitals and medical centers, uh, doctors' offices, yoga studios, that this is what really, um, really sank to my heart because people might be in a waiting room or my art might be in their hospital uh, room or in the <clears throat> the lobbies of the ho- uh, of the um of the doctors offices and I started having uh my oil paintings rotate from one one center to another and I called that exhibit healing blue waters and then when Lori and I uh had the wonderful opportunity to have our book produced I said Lori, my dream is to have a traveling photo exhibit, and we're going to call it Yoga on and Off the Wall, and when you're in the country, you're going to help make it come alive off the wall and engage the attendees. Um, or there was one time, I think it was last fall, we have an exhibit over at the University of Minnesota Fairview, Southdale. Uh, cancer center where Lori actually taught the nurses, the doctors, and um, and the other staff members techniques to give them calmness. And we've also done this in in nursing homes. So I I just find that my artwork is is bringing um, a peacefulness and. You know, one of the goals of an artist is to just evoke emotions from their viewers. And one of my favorite stories is this painting I did. It was named Tranquility. It's kind of become my signature piece. Lori, do you remember that painting of the canoe that's resting at the dockside? Yes, beautiful. And there's the mist that is coming off the lake. And I did this once when I was camping with my parents. Yes, I used to go tent camping. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the person that bought this painting said that it just brought back such memories of her childhood. Of She could smell the coffee. She could hear the sound of the loons. And just looking at the mist rising off the lake brought her tranquility. So it just it gives me so much pleasure to have that type of comment and to know that my art is bringing peace to whether it's the caregiver or uh the dementia patient i mean they all appreciate um having a a pretty scene to look at oh definitely and, you know another thing is the videos that we've done and Lori, you might want to say a little bit about that. Oh, the, well, the videos, um, Nancy uh, so generously offered to um, 
video my mom uh, when Barbara Lee Friedman was singing to her, uh, and it was so powerful because my mom was in her end stages, and she continues to be, um, but she would just come alive, you know, and then in between songs she'd kind of go back to sleep, and then she'd wake back up and, and interact and be animated, and those videos, I mean, I, I don't even know how many th- thousands of hits um, on these we have, but I get comments every single week still on my YouTube channel just saying how powerful they are and how people didn't realize um, the importance of music and that they could still um take it in and they could still react to it and they could still get pleasure from it or people will say yeah my mom does the same you know or my dad loves music too and it's one of our our bright spots so i'll never be able to thank you enough for those videotapes because even when i'm having a down day i go watch them and they pick me up because i i I see the I, I just I love see the glint of the that eye. Mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead, Nancy. Um, I love watching the one of Barbara saying to your mom and your mother, in spite of her dementia, the the words came back and she was singing along with her. And then she's just keeping beat to the the music. And you can see her hands going up and down. It is absolutely sweet. When both of my parents were in hospice settings, in NC Little Hospice in Edina, Minnesota, um, Barbara came to entertain both my parents, and in each situation, other families that were visiting would... I'm getting an echo. Yep, yep, and I'm not sure what that... Yes, but it, it could be Skype because that's the platform that Blog Talk uses, and usually oh. doesn't last very long. Yeah, but, after about um, twenty minutes. Do you want to try a connection again, or? Um, you know, if you guys want to try calling in, um, and disconnect and call back in, we can go ahead and try that. Okay, because it's pretty fuzzy. It, yeah, it's getting really bad, yeah. This is unusual. <laughs> okay, let's so, try again. Okay, sounds good. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, can't control technology. Lori and uh, Nancy will both call back in again, and we'll we'll get them live um, on the show. We just have a, a little bit of time here left. But I, I really encourage you to um, check out their website, breaththechange.com, or you can go to nancysharkran.com as well. Um, and if you're interested in seeing any of those music videos, you can just go to YouTube and look up Alzheimer's Speaks. And I, I think one of them's got over like 60,000 hits on it. And I've literally walked into conferences and seen my mom up on the big screen. And so um, very, very powerful, um, powerful, powerful video. So I think we have you both back again. So hopefully. Yeah, it's clearer we'll now. Much better, much better. Yep, it's one of those things, you know, instead of getting mad, breathe deep. <laughs> You did it. <laughs> you know, and what's interesting is uh, one of the things that I find with, you know, the technology glitches is the people who get most upset with it, it uh, is not uh, people who are dealing with dementia. It's mm-hmm. business professionals in, because in the scheme of things, it's just not a big deal. You call back in, you reconnect, you breathe deep because there's a, a lot more important stuff going on. So it's kind of funny. I do a lot of webinars and with the radio and people go, doesn't that upset you? And I'm like, you know, dementia is here to teach us tolerance. Yes. <laughs> it really, I mean, of how many things do we worry about and get mad about that just is irrelevant? And is that how you really want to spend your time? You know, so it's um, so. Thank you for being an example once again. 
what they're saying on, <laughs> on how we can change that. And our audience could all take a deep breath and just thank uh, thank the universe for that time to breathe deeply and be conscious um, that they've got a moment that they didn't know they were going to have. So. <laughs> You know what, Lori, what you were just doing, what actually we were all doing is, you know, the laughter that it brought, too. You know, in in Reader's Digest, how laughter is the best medicine. I think that whatever we can do as caregivers or, you know, as getting patients to laugh is just one of the most positive, powerful things we can do for ourselves. Oh, I agree. You know, plus it's... You know, it it changes your your body and your physics of your body, but it also laughter is. I mean, it creates memories, wonderful, right. powerful memories. And um, you know, for me with my mom, uh, you know, that's one of my goals is let's just be silly. It's not about fitting in a box anymore. It's about having fun. It's about having those yeah. precious moments. Um, if they make sense or not, doesn't it doesn't matter anymore. It's just about the connection. Yes. Well, and you know what? It's the, it's the best way to get the breath in the belly. There's not a better way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's to well, do, that, you know, the belly laughter. Yeah, well, and they even have laughter yoga now, too. Do you do that right? as well, Lord? Yes, yes, yes. I love it. Yeah. It's um well what a nice way to to combine things. We only have about 10 minutes left. I, I can't believe how fast this has gone. I can't um, either. So I I'm going to flip back cuz I really want to um talk with Lori a little bit about um her, you know, your new organization Breath Logic, which is a nonprofit organization. And can you mm-hmm. tell us, you know, kind of what what's your what's your vision for this organization? Well, um, breath logic. How we decided, you know, the name. There were a lot of, a lot of different uh, names that went around. I, I would have loved the breath magic, also or breath <laughs> miracle. But um, breath. We decided on breath logic because we thought, if with this organization we can really help people realize that it is, it's it's logical. It's common sense that we go to our breath first when we realize that there's, you know, there's something happening in our body. It's like um, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, that's so important, what we eat, how we nourish ourselves. But, you know, Lori, I think we can take it one step further and say, let thy breath be thy medicine. Because if we can, again, program ourselves to keep coming back to our breath all throughout the day, to realize that when we're feeling anything that's not helpful to our well-being, that we just have this medicine in our breath. I mean, we nourish ourselves at such a very powerful core deep level with our breath. So we want to take this out into medical centers. You know, my um, brother, my, my mother died in April, and then my oldest brother died in June, and he died of COPD. And he had been in um, medical centers where he received Wonderful care, excellent care, but not once did anyone try to work with him with his physical breath. Really? With his, oh, that just with seems his own, Yeah, with his own physical breath. So this is something that we want to do with Breath Logic. We have some pilot programs starting with Park Niglet, and we see that being taken out all over. And then also having breath awareness practices taught as curriculum in schools and um, just taking it out to people everywhere that would not be able to go to an exercise class or a yoga class. Like, for example, um, when I was in Cambodia, I worked with young girls rescued from brothels. And these young girls, I mean, their spirits were crushed. 
and just working them, working with them with the breath, helping them to come back into being present in their bodies, just brought about amazing healing and transformation. People coming back from wars with PTSD, veterans, helping them with breath practices. I mean, Lori, the sky's the limit with this because we all breathe. We all breathe. It doesn't matter our, our gender, our age, our strength, flexibility. We can all be so benefited by breath awareness and breath practices. I might well, want to mention uh, Lori's an international peace ambassador, and she has shared with me about this pilot study that she is doing with the elementary school children in Saudi Arabia. And Lori, why don't you just touch on that? Because I love you telling me about how the kids go home and share their ah, lessons with well, their parents. <laughs> Parents come back and say, you know, I start to get upset or angry and my son or my daughter says, Mom, just breathe. <laughs> <laughs> but you, and, and Nancy, thank you for bringing that up because, see, so much about the breath is, is about peace, is that the more we bring our awareness to our breath and just take time to notice when we're inhaling, feel that, and feel the difference then in the exhalation, the letting go, the taking in, the giving and the receiving that life is all about. You know, as as a caregiver, as receiving care. You know, this is this is the breath. This is life. And the more we do this, the more peaceful we become. And it's not just a a, a momentary experience of peace, but it becomes more and more state of being for us. And then we take that out to our relationships, uh, to the communities, we take it out into the world. So it's something that seems so simple, but again, it is so powerful. It it really, it very much is. And I think, you know, I love the beauty of the getting this into the schools because Kids are so powerful, and, I mean, they're the ones that got us to wear the seatbelts. They've gotten us to quit smoking, um, mm-hmm. you know, right. because, because of their nagging. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but w- whatever works to change these, uh, you know, bad habits of adults, um, let's make it better for our, for our children. And they're they're brilliant because they're eager and they, you know, to learn and they want to share this information it's uh you know it's a, it's a beautiful beautiful way to to transcend things um mm-hmm. my friend James Creasy who has the adaptive croquet uh Jiminy Wicket you know brings it into the school systems and it's all about removing the fear and building the awareness and showing that there's life with this disease you know mm-hmm. and and that's exactly what you're doing you're giving people coping skills um in terms of how to how to deal with things, and if we can get rid of a lot of the issues with bullying and stress, I mean, school is a very right. very stressful place for right. kids. Um, the competition is fierce, and you know the confidence is low. And to be able to to give them that centered, peaceful place that everything is going to be okay is is brilliant, um, mm-hmm. and it's, it's a mm-hmm. wonderful. So that's very, very exciting to do. I would love to see BreathLogic also be more involved with um, with dementia, with the larger associations in terms yes. of doing meditations and teaching people how to breathe because, again, as I had mentioned earlier, the anxiety level is massive, absolutely mm-hmm. massive, and mm-hmm. this could be so, so helpful <clears throat> Um, to mm-hmm. to help people learn how to cope, and again, um, you know, not just once you're in the middle of crisis. I mean, we have to be proactive, and that's the beauty of getting right. into the into the schools. Um, and and mm-hmm. real life, and starting kids, young, starting mm-hmm. young. Yes. Yep. And understanding that ripple effect that we have on one another. So, um, and I think I mentioned this in the first half of the show, even if you come in with a smile on your face, everybody can feel your angst. (laughs) No, you're not hiding it as well as you think you are. And so um, let's just 
get rid of that and, and get centered. We only have about a minute here left, so um, I, I just want to make sure that people know how to reach you. I would have loved to have done a, a little meditation, but we ran out of time. So um, to contact you, you can go to www.breathethechange.com or you can mm-hmm. go to uh, Nancy's website, Nancy uh, Chakran, uh, dot com, and that's C-H-A-K-R-I-N. And you can reach either of them, either Lori or Nancy, at breathethechange.com. And Lori is spelled L-A-U-R-I-E. So, I, again, I want to thank you both so much for being uh, with us on the show today. Well, it was a delight. Lori, thank Lori, you. we so respect what you are doing for the world. Thank you. Well, great. And we will see you later this month. Excellent. And I'm looking, looking forward, forward to that. that. Okay. And the rest of you, we will talk again next week from Wisconsin where we're going to roll out a dementia-friendly community in the U.S. Yes. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Bye now. Bye. 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 It's time to rethink, renew, and reimagine retirement. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now, this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire. Become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.